am super excited to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ruth Hobson from Doctors Data. Dr. Ruth Hobson graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon in 2014 with a doctorate in naturopathic medicine and an additional certificate in natural childbirth. She returned to NUNM to complete her residency where she was responsible for overseeing patient care, guiding medical students in patient care, and facilitating clinical education classes. Dr. Hobson currently splits her time between consulting with and speaking for doctor's data and her own private practice focusing on hormone balancing and aesthetic medicine. Dr. Hobson, thank you for joining us today. I'll hand it over to you to start your presentation. Thank you, Angie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am excited to talk about this topic today. Um, give me one second. I'm having a little difficulty advancing my slides. There we go. Um, as you see, hopefully in this presentation, you're going to find new approaches to patient care. I'm going to throw out a, 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 maybe a new way for you to look at HPA access health here. Now together, here's our little roadmap. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna review the healthy HPA access um, regulation. So what does it look like when it's normal? And then we're gonna talk about some physiologic or adaptive changes that can happen. And then look at um, including phasing. What does that look like in dysfunction? We're gonna think about physiologic changes in the body. And then let's review some testing options. Um, of course, we'll look at the HPA access um, in depth by reviewing diurnal cortisol, cortisol awakening response, and metabolites. <clears throat> and hopefully in this talk, you're going to gain some tools that will help you optimize HPA access dysfunction once we identify it. <laughs> now, when we think about stress as a practitioner, we typically think about the adrenal glands, right? Um, the constant use of these poor guys as, a pa um, as patients, you know, negative life, and I would say in the day-to-day, -day, but also during times of stress. So you can see from this little black and white image here that there does appear that everything is kind of out to get them. Um, we have the normal day-to-day -day life, and then we have some other things. We think about like fear and caffeine and allergies and overstimulation in general. Um, so the adrenal glands themselves do seem to be taking a hit. But now, when we think about, um, the truth is, is that when we think about adrenals here, we're actually, you know, we think about that because that's where we can test, right? We can test cortisol, which is the major hormone excreted from the adrenal gland. Now, I'm not telling you anything new here, but what we do know is that the stress system is so much more than just um, cortisol, right? We see the large portion of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis is housed within the brain and it receives input in this way. Yet cortisol has become the best surrogate marker for the whole pathway. So when we think about why are we measuring this, what we're actually trying to decide is the relationship between a stressor and its metabolic effect what's our reserve capacity of our patient, right? And then we additionally want to think about acute and chronic stressors. How have they affected the circadian rhythm of our HPA access? And also, you know, potentially, what are the most likely therapies to um, increase a person's ability to improve the HPA access? So again, we're going to look at cortisol and see why that's been the best surrogate marker. Now, the reason we look at cortisol as a marker for stress is that we see a direct correlation with ACTH. And ACTH is going to stimulate cortisol, so that makes a lot of sense. And we also, if you look in the graphs here, we'll see a very similar curve throughout the day. This is 24 hours here. And now in this study, <clears throat> is looking at plasma ACTH and cortisol. If you were to look at salivary measurements, you could see there's about a 20 minute delay, but the same pattern occurs. And 
And the roles of cortisol span multi systems. And I think that's that's going to be the focus of our topic today. So if if you gain nothing from this, follow the story of the over um, arching uh, cortisol expansion, I would say. So think about multi systems when we're when we get to treatment for sure. But this is kind of the why. So when we think about cortisol in the event of like an immediate stressor, that short term stressor, we see that it helps maintain healthy blood supply and nutrition to the brain and the heart and muscles for immediate survival. We need to run away from this tiger, people will say. We also are going to have an increased energy production. So that's going to be recruiting things like glucose and fatty acids and amino acids, um, and also going to enhance some gluconeogenesis. So we're going to, um, you know, look at that system as well. Also, we're going to think about optimizing energy production from, you know, short term. We need a little bit of energy to run from that tiger, but is it also maybe at the expense of our long term metabolic function? Maybe not in the short term, but we're going to look and see how that could possibly be happening in the in the chronic stress or the long term. And then um, what I also want to say is that the HPA access will always require some reallocation of resources. So we're kind of in this buy now, pay later mode, if you will. So to understand this concept, let's give ourselves some definitions, shall we? So allostasis is similar to homeostasis. It's the, um, this is described as a system whose normal function and rhythmic fluctuations, right? This is stability um, through change. Now, when we think about allostatic load, this is what you're going to see in the research. This was um, first coined by McEwen as a researcher, and this describes the load of a stressor upon a biological system, as well as the effort required to respond to the stressor. Now, essentially, allostatic load is the metabolic cost to reestablish that physiologic stressor. Um, and you will see... that over time, the greater the allostatic load, the greater the wear and tear from the too much stress. This is gonna result in an inability to kind of turn off that stress response when it's no longer needed, eventually changing our physiology. And this is where you'll see adaptation happen. Now, when we think about adaptation, you know, we're gonna think about cortisol, that sympathetic activity, potentially those pro-inflammatory cytokines that are going to be mediated there. Um, and then also a decline in that parasympathetic activity or the ability to kind of rest and digest. Now let's use the example of our body's need for glucose. So when we're responding to an acute stressor, um, we need immediate glucose is released from their brain and muscles and repeated hits of this to the system over time. You can see this down regulation of insulin sensitivity that's commonly seen in our offices, right? Uh, central adiposity, type two diabetes. Those are things that will come to mind. Those are examples of allostatic overload. So the stress system is designed to help the body survive when the body's in survival um, mode. It's not worried about depleting metabolic reserves, right? And just needs to survive. Um, so the stress system is designed to help the body in that way. And then when it's um, in survival mode, typically that's when you are going to see patients enter into your office. So what does that look like? Well, not an extensive list. But these are things that you will commonly see um, with HPA axis dysfunction and that allostatic overload that we were just talking about. You know, I can't sleep. I have some depression. Um, thinking about reliance on substances. Maybe I don't feel like hanging out with my friends anymore. I really can't exercise. Um, you know, and then moving over into anxiolytic medications or I need to take meds to sleep now. All in all, just um, doing things to cope with their current situation. You know, but why are our patients continuing to have these symptoms after the stressors are over? You know, that's something that I talk a lot about with patients. And the truth is, um, you know, we don't just bounce back. Our emergency system and our normal biological um needs and pathways will run on the same road. So essentially we're utilizing the same pathway, right? Just like emergency vehicles, 
the stress response system uh, will continue to send signals um, until the body feels that it's safe, well taken care of, and then we can start to downregulate that. And that's where we come in as practitioners. How are we going to downregulate it? What do we need to address to make sure that we aren't continuing with this um, fight or flight response that can happen? So I am going to challenge you a little bit today. So when we think about the HPA axis, let's go a little bit beyond cortisol. Of course, that's going to be important cortisol creation. What do we do for, for that? And we'll talk all about that. But understanding that the HP access is more than that, that it's um, really an energy management system. It's going to upregulate those metabolic systems that coincide with diurnal activities and energy needs. Think about sleep-wake cycles. When we're eating and feeding, those kinds of things, you, you know, you know, want to focus on in those. Then also think about how this is going to modulate cell metabolism, anticipatory for energy availability. Um, I think about, you know, glucose control, glucose regulation with that. And then preparing immune functions for increased vulnerabilities. That's going to be tied to more of that um, anticipatory activity. Um, and then, of course, remembering that we can have disruptions in any of these areas. I'm going to show a great image here. Um, and that when we have survival mode going, could be any of these areas that we need to address before the body feels safe enough to return back so that individuals can thrive. So this image um, I've adopted in my clinical practice and I wanted to share it with you here today. So if you attended our LENS conference in Vegas this year, you became quite familiar with this image. And if you are looking for an excellent resource to continue your learning on this topic, I would recommend um, the book on the right by Thomas Gillums. He was the phenomenal speaker um, that gave me this information. Um, it's honestly, I would say more of um, a great resource. In fact, maybe even my Bible when it comes to the HPA access health, if you will. Now we think about, we think about four quadrants of this image. We think about the treatment, of course, but I challenge you to also think about glycemic dysregulation, inflammation, circadian disruption, psychological factors when you're also taking your history. As this will allow you to become more holistic in your approach to HP access recovery. And of course, you know, we need to see the testing. So let's talk a little bit about that. So doctor's data offers several tests for assessing HPA access. Um, we will see that you can pretty much add this um, testing onto other panels as well. You'll see them linked in some of the combination kits that are gonna happen with um, neurotransmitters and or hormones, but typically you'll see a diurnal cortisol. So that's gonna be four cortisol points throughout the day, an AM 30 or 30 minutes after waking, another time at noon, evening, and then at night. And we'll also, DHEA is gonna be important in the HPA access. We'll talk about that also today. Um, there are, you can run single point AM 30 and PM, but I'm going to hopefully show you why I think a diurnal rhythm will give you a little bit more information throughout the day and it help you make more clinical decisions. Um, but there are times when we must run those. So just know that those are, are also available for you. Then the cortisol awakening response. Now, um, this test is going to be interesting. I'm going to show you some different variations of it and, you know, what we can learn from that. It is just focused on the morning, although you can add that to a diurnal rhythm and get the whole um, combination of that. And I'll show you some of those today as well. It's going to consist of a waking uh, sample AM 30, so 30 minutes after waking, and then 60 minutes after waking. And it's really important. Those timing factors are really important for the cortisol awakening response. We'll talk a little bit about what happens in the future, but let's, let's take a minute to kind of just think about the diurnal rhythm. Now I wanted to show you this handout or um, here we see just based, I would say more for treatment so that we can see where individuals are falling, but we have phased uh, zero through three where zero is healthy. And then one encompasses different patterns. I would say you're going to see spikes. You're going to see increased HPX's tone or more of that zigzag pattern um, and then elevated upper or even normal AM values with that blunting afterwards. 
Moving on into phase two, this is going to be more of that suboptimal or low AM cortisol and then some HPA axis blunting thereafter. And of course, we see that phase three, these are the flatline, really significant um, hypofunctioning. All right, the healthy, ideal cortisol curve. I It's very rare that I get one of these in practice, but I have actually seen them in the wild. So that's really, really fun. Here you have an example. Um, ideally, cortisol is going to be the highest at that AM30. And then it's going to gradually drop throughout the day with this lowest point being at night. You know, that makes sense because we want to wake up. We need a little bit of cortisol to do that. And then when we, when we want to rest, we need less cortisol. So this is a generally what the curve should look like throughout the day. Now, when we think about allostatic load or even allostatic overload, we start to see some adaptations that can happen within the adrenal phase these year. So phase one, here we see that the, the um, dysfunction is that we have this overall heightened response. Um, we especially start to see that more at the noon, evening, and night levels. And again, you can. I'm going to show you yeah, another phase one that's going to look like more of our zigzag pattern. With that spike later in the day, that, that's going to indicate dysregulation, right? We shouldn't be having a greater spike than we would for AM30. Again, AM30 technically should be our highest point throughout the day. So here you see, you know, evening. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what to do. This is going to be based on so, so many factors. Um, of course, appropriate testing. Did we avoid exercise? Those things will come into play. But if this was a normal um, curve, I would say for a patient, they follow directions, did everything appropriately, and we have a big spike in the evening, I would expect them to kind of feel like they get a second wind at night. And then what can we do with that? Um, is that supplementation? Is that some lifestyle things that we need to implement? And, and that's where we'll kind of utilize this in some cases in the future. The suboptimal AM value here, and we see that we also have this blunted curve that's starting to happen throughout the day. And this is really indicative of that phase two. It's pretty normal what I'll see for phase two. So everything is just dropped down a little bit lower. Um, this is going to need more timing, potentially, and more maybe supplementation and lifestyle modifications than you would see if you were working in a phase one. So that's where phasing can kind of help on the report as well, give you an idea of length of treatment potentially, but also that you, you know, what we need to do as we progress through the phases. Now, this is a phase three, and that is, you know, very low in the morning. It also has that blunted, um, you know, cortisol for the rest of the day. And this is associated with that suboptimal physiologic and um, psychological development, a diminished sense of well-being. You know, these are individuals that take a little bit longer to bounce back. And whether that's a year, whether that's two years, these are these are kind of the long haulers, I would say. It's taken a long time for most people to get to be a flatliner. So, you know, think about that as we're you know, giving realistic treatment goals for people. This is the phase three individual is probably gonna take a little bit of time. If you need a little like where to start, I think this is a good place to start. It is by no means an exhaustive list of everything that you could consider for HP access dysfunction, but it is available on the website under news and knowledge. You'll find, you'll find this handout. And um, I would also say when we're thinking about treatments here, the lifestyle modifications are going to also include those four pillars that we talked about before, you know, circadian rhythm, thinking about infl inflammation, um, you know, we can kind of go back to glucose control, psychosocial things. Um, that's all going to be important for HPA access recovery. You know, but of course, there's there's a bit more to the story of evaluating the stress response than just the four-point diurnal rhythm. So let's explore that a little bit. Our diurnal pattern that we've established is great for baseline. It gives us information about circadian influence and the natural influence of cortisol throughout the day. But it isn't, um, isn't it always best to kind of challenge the system? Um, I think I, I naturally love to do that. Um, 
Let's think a little bit about the glucose tolerance test. So I, I think about the cortisol awakening response, very similar to that, where you're giving some glucose and you really want to see glycemic control of the individual. Well, when we think about the stress system, we also have a very safe and natural way to think to you know, provoke the stress response. Um, you can use this provocation test to allow the glimpse into the HPA axis. And this will give you an idea about plasticity or flexibility within the HPA axis. But what happens? Well, the natural occurrence of waking is actually going to be your stress response. So before we wake, cortisol is blunted. And we have this reduced sensitivity naturally to ACTH. And remember, that's what's going to stimulate cortisol. It's all controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which you can see lives in our brain here. As soon as we have a light or a light influence, we will see that we start to go, we have a little switch that turns on. Um, and then we see more cortisol influence. We have HPA axis activation. Um, our sensitivity to ACTH increases, and then we're going to have, therefore, even more adrenal sensitivity in the presence of light to um, continue this pathway. So it's going to be a little bit more of a stress event every day when you wake. Now, this actually does not happen if you were to wake from a nap, per se, although I, th I think if you were sleeping maybe long term, this was really long, long, long naps, you might get a little bit of um a cortisol waking response there. Uh, but typically we just see that with waking for the day. Now, in the research, you will see that there's this natural rise of cortisol that you will see just to wake us up. And that happens anywhere from 30 to 40, maybe 45 minutes after waking. And then you're going to see this notable drop. And that's about an hour. So you'll see that things kind of come back down to either baseline or lower. And the cortisol awakening response can be used as a biomarker um, for HPA ac access function um, in routine clinical practice. So it's pretty easy for us to use this. Um, and it's, I would say, when we think about HPA access reactivity or anticipatory stress, those are the two things I can't see on a diurnal rhythm and would love to know in that moment to moment stress, how, you know, what is my patient feeling? How are they perceiving stress? Um, and this test will give you a little peek into that. So this is what it's going to look like if you were, you know, just to order the cortisol waking response by itself, you'll see these three points um, here. Again, waking, 30 minutes after waking, and 60 minutes. So this is an optimal, perfect curve. You see, um, you know, the rise is between 35 to 60. And then um, you're going to see, this will be the printout here. And then you'll see um, the decline is also optimal. It's at negative 13%. So you want to see that it goes at least to baseline or zero and then even falling lower. And that's in comparison to um, the waking value. So the decline is com in comparison to the waking value for that percentage. All right. And here is an example of an elevated cortisol awakening response. So what we notice here is that the AM30 value measured from waking is well over 60%. And that doesn't even return to baseline or lower afterwards. So that's why the decline is marked that it's elevated. So this individual might be seen as having a, a little bit more um, dramatic or increased initial response to stress and then has a difficult time recovering from stress. So these are individuals that, you know, I maybe, and maybe they have repeated hits throughout their day. Think about those clients. Um, if, if this is the case where they just, they're not going to be able to calm themselves down. And no wonder they're going to kind of always be in a little heightened sense of um, cortisol there. Now, I would say for treatment, for some people, this is going to be things like, you know, deep breathing. For others, this is definitely going to be therapy or um, addressing inflammation and thinking about glycemic control. Those are all burdens of this on the system. So you'll know best based on your patient, but this is an idea of that elevated car. I just can't come down from stress. 
you know, it's really a loss of flexibility or plasticity within the system when they can't, when they can't return. Common reasons for elevations in car, they, these aren't positive, but we do see correlative um, data here. This can be ongoing job-related or perceived stress. Um, I would say if you're testing, I always love to do all of my HP access testing during a normal work week and avoiding weekends, especially the car. So when you think about the cortisol awakening response, just know that um, it can be influenced on perceived stress. So ugh, when you, even in waking, I really don't want to do my day. You're going to see that. That's going to be influenced here. Um, it'll also driving up uh, the cortisol awakening response can be light. <clears throat> in fact, that's the best treatment that I can think of if you need to get that um, AM30 value as high as possible. Um, somebody sent that question in that I would say wake uh, light upon waking is going to be the best. Um, you can also see that depression, of course, ovulation phase of menstruation, you will see more um, increase in the cortisol awakening response. I remember if you're adding sex hormones to this, you want to do this in luteal phase. Um, sleep issues, you can see that. You can see all kinds of patterns with sleep issues. And of course, just being having older age, more stress into the system. Now let's look at the other, the other side of the coin. This is the other end of the spectrum is a blunted car, right? So everything is a little bit low. Now I consider this more of a serious result when I see it. These patients likely need longer treatment protocols for healing and cortisol supplementation even could be considered here if that's in your wheelhouse. Um, and likely all areas of lifestyle modification are going to be needed for recovery. And this is going to be um, establishing uh, circadian rhythm. So really what's what's daytime, what's nighttime, whether that's light and you know thinking about sleep hygiene, really making sure that we're sleeping. It can also be things like, are we eating regularly timed meals? If we're fasting, hopefully we're not fasting too long. You know, when you get this back, this will kind of give you an idea that they've lost complete flexibility within the system and now, and, and function. And when they have stress, um, there's so much, I would say, dysregulation that they can't respond appropriately to stress. You'll see this, this is, I mean, when you get this back, and I think burnout is something that we hear a lot in clinical practice. At first it was coming from providers and now it's definitely trickled down to patients that so you'll see burnout is gonna be something that this pattern is gonna be indicative of. Of course, a lot of other things, we'll think about chronic fatigue or sleep apnea, PTSD, um, just, in general, if you don't see the sun in the morning, if you're you worked on your sleep hygiene so hardcore and now you're in a really dark cave and there's no way to get light in, you also might have this blunted curve. Um, and in that case, maybe it's a, a alarm clock that wakes you with sleep or you know something in that way. Now, I because the cortisol awakening response is so sensitive and there is that timing factor. I want to give you a few pointers. This is how I set up my clients for success. And so I think to make the collection as easy as possible, the best thing to do is to set out the collection tube, that waking, at least the waking tube within arm's reach of the bed the night before. I also like to put a pen and pad um, beside that so that you can write down the time that you woke up because you'll inevitably forget. Um, and then... After you, you know, do that, you can then set an alarm for about 30 minutes for 30 minutes and then another one for 60. And those, and I like to write those times down as well, that usually will get my patients um, a, a great sample um, and something that I can interpret. Let's, let's start to think about these, these cases. Let's put a little case together with a diurnal and a cortisol making response, shall we? So the first case, we'll talk about Michael. He's 50 years old, uh, account executives, pretty, um, we got stress. His BMI is 28. He has recently thinking about keto, intermittent fasting is pretty big right now. Um, exercise, he's weight training, he's moving his body. He is walking his dog in the morning and night. He's on some testosterone. Most of his labs, you know, outside of what we're going to show, those are within normal limits. So, you know, pretty, pretty healthy. Um, does have some stress. So let's look at first the diurnal rhythm. 
and, and we can interpret that. Um, so here we see just a normal phase one. So we have some dysfunction, but it's not, it's still, still within. It's just barely suboptimal in the evening, uh, but really good still at morning curve. I love to see that. We still have appropriate amounts of cortisol in the morning. You know, it dips down at noon against kind of in the bottom of the green, but still great. And then the evening dips down into suboptimal. So let's look at what happens when we add the cortisol awakening response. So here we see um, what this reveals is the lack of response by the HPA axis, right? It's seen solely in the car. So we have a lack of rise, you can see, and we also have a major drop that's below the normal level of decline. So this patient isn't responding to a stress very well. Likely explaining, I would say the patient's symptoms of fatigue, maybe even some of that decreased motivation or mental sharpness. And this patient is at um, increased risk of becoming a phase two very soon, and I think should be treated more aggressively. And sometimes the diurnal rhythm is not revealing and you see um, phase one, but this patient says he's, stressed and having trouble coping. Um, so even though he has a, you know, a phase one, he does still have some symptoms. And I think it's related to that cortisol awakening response that we're seeing here. So I'm happy that we ordered the cortisol awakening response. Otherwise we might have missed the lack of that rise and that heavy decline. And then I would say that this is going to say that the, just the resilience isn't there. And we'd like to increase his ability to respond to stress appropriately. So, um, Let's look and see. Because we have that upper range AM waking value, I this could be blood sugar. Um, you know, cortisol will spike, and in an attempt to either wake us up or just let us know that we need to eat occasionally. And because he's doing some more fasting, I think potentially we need to think about um, could this be a low blood sugar event? I recommended some protein prior to bed, and then you know you can also think about. Maybe it's a nuts or some cheese before bed if they can eat that. Um, and then, of course, things to help with cortisol creation, B-complex, vitamin D and C, adaptogens. Um, those are pretty standard. You're going to tailor this to your patient, um, but this is a typical uh, treatment, I would say, for phase one. Now, when we have case two is Lisa. Lisa is thinking about, is complaining about fatigue and I can't concentrate, I can't think. I'm gaining a little bit of weight in my midsection. I think that's most postmenopausal women that I see. This is a very normal complaints that I see from them. Can't fall asleep or I'm having trouble staying asleep. Um, there is some past history. She's a nurse, but there is some past history of fibromyalgia or current history of fibromyalgia and IBS. Um, she does skip meals. Again, due to her job, and she does drink a lot of coffee. She's just too tired because she's on her feet all day, so she's not exercising. She just have a little bit of elevated triglycerides, and her thyroid is is kind of talking to us a little bit and might need some support there. But outside those, let's look and see what her cortisol graph looks like. So here we see a flat line to the diurnal curve. So this is our phase three, and the cortisol awakening response. Let's. Let's see what we'll add here. Does it give us any more information? So the cortisol awakening response is inverted. So it's showing a disordered ability to respond to stress, right? Um, this expected decline was higher. So that also means that cortisol went up when it should have gone down. So as you've probably gathered from the history, we've got some work to do. And this is, you know, Again, very typical treatments you'll see for the HP access, but we're going to help her sustain her energy and her blood sugar throughout regular meals. I think that's going to be pivotal for her recovering and getting able to do her job. Yes, but just feeling better. We're going to support her thyroid. Give I did give some cortisol replacement. Um, if that's in your wheelhouse, think about five milligrams in the morning. And then I did it again at noon. I am trying to establish some diurnal um, patterning for her, really give her what is what is morning, what is night. So we're thinking about light box therapy for her and then some supplements to, again, work on cortisol creation. One more case. 
I'm going to show you. Um, so this is a 19 year old. Um, and really her, her main complaint has been motivation. Um, feeling a little depressed and anxious, but also stressed, gaining weight, some acne is happening. Um, she's a college sophomore, um, kind of missing some classes due to lack of motivation and not being able to stay on task and organize. She eats a lot of takeout. She does try to exercise doing like HIIT training or high intensity workouts. She runs every day. She does yoga sometimes, but although, although her diet needs some tweaking, she's, she's working out. So um, we will see how this plays into her HPA axis. Now here's an example I would say a really disordered HPA axis dysfunction. Um, the cortisol we'll look at here, we see, I think we have phase two. I would say lost the lack of curve in the morning for that morning cortisol. We have a little bit of a blip in the evening. Maybe that is you know a rhythm that's set up her exercise or timing of exercise. But then let's look at what happens with the, the car here. So when once we wake, we see that we have this dramatic rise of cortisol that really rises too steeply. And then the recovery is delayed. So this is, remember we did the example of an elevated car. So this is an elevated car. Once she is stimulated, she really goes for it, first of all, and then she cannot come back down. Again, this is gonna be, I would say total overhaul, I think, even with, you know, supplementation, it's the diet and the lifestyle piece for recovery of the HP axis that I want to stress is, is huge. And so we have to become better cheerleaders and we have to just actually think about how to make this, um, good for every patient, because this is what they actually need. You know, we can supplement them all day long, but until we can get some of these lifestyle things under control, we aren't going to see a lot of change. Now, light box therapy here is something that I did for her, um, or I gave her the option of using a light uh, waking alarm clock. I have good success with those alarm clocks if you see them out there. If you're looking for light box therapy, I just want to tell you it's usually about 10,000 lumens for about 15 to 20 minutes a day, and that, um, that can be really helpful. Now, let's flip to... Oh, I went so fast. Let's flip to that other side of the coin, we can look at urinary testing to add to our story here. So we've kind of exhausted salivary. Let's look at urinary. Now, currently there's very little published data on corticoid metabolism. So this, this test that we are doing or looking at is on the forefront of discovery and companies like doctor's data need to collect info and look at patterns along with you. Um, but here's what we know. So we know that when we are looking at Cortisol is the active form and cortisone, which is the storage form. It's the 11 beta HSD enzyme that we are most concerned with. And that's what's going to kind of flip back and forth between active and storage. And there's two different kinds. This is most active in the kidney. So you can imagine that as we're giving urine sample, you're going to see this um, influence. Uh, we will see that high uh, HSD1 pulls cortisol out of storage. And then HSD2, protecting that mineral corticoid receptor from the effects of cortisol, you'll see that that is going to shunt towards cortisone. Now, there's a couple of things that I like to look at when we think about um, urinary testing. And a lot of it has to do with these metabolized um, and free levels. So when we want to look at more of what the body has utilized, let's think about more of the metabolized levels. So metabolized cortisol here, um, we can think about, it is actually involves cortisone as well, um, but this is going to be increased cortisol clearance. So we can say that's overproduction of cortisol. That can also be influenced by things like obesity and insulin resistance, inflammation, hyperthyroidism. And then let's look at the other end of the coin. If let's say we had low metabolized cortisol, cortisone metabolites. So this could be a decreased clearance. You could also be due to um, inflammation. You see that's coming in both pathways, obesity, insulin resistance, but then hypothyroidism. Now, I also like to kind of get a preference of what, what's happening with the body um, because we can look at um, cortisol and cortisone, um, the free levels, 
that I'll show you kind of in a case. But when we want to know what's happening in the body, I think more about the metabolites. So the cortisol, cortisone metabolites, um, we're looking at gives clinicians a better idea of the overall preference for the body. So again, metabolized cortisol gives you what the body is utilized. Think about this maybe as output. Whereas um, cortisol, cortisone metabolites are going to be more of a preference. If we have a preference within the body, are we making more cortisol? Are we making more cortisone? Of course, the free levels, again, are just going to give you some information without out metabolites, just cortisol, cortisone. That's going to give you information about the enzyme activity that we just talked about. I'm going to give you a little lab here. Um, have a little bit more to get through. I think we can make it. So let's look at the lab. First, we're going to see if we look over at the dial that we are, you know, potentially dialed more towards cortisone if you're looking at free levels. However, remember, because there is such a local conversion in the kidneys of cortisol to cortisone, we're looking at metabolized cortisol and cortisone metabolites. Remember, that's the better indication of systemic preference. So I've highlighted that there. And um, what you can see is that the cortisol cortisone ratio, well, that ratio favors cortisone. Um, it's low, so it favors the bottom analyte. The cortisol cortisone metabolites are elevated, favoring the top analyte, which is the cortisol metabolites. So systemically, this patient is favoring cortisol. And the metabolites cortisol, um, and, and cortisone metabolites, that's within normal limits. So think about metabolized cortisol as active and potential, right? So we have a appropriate amount, but we're, you know, favoring more systemically cortisol. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we have high cortisol metabolites, it, it may be potentially we don't necessarily need to support cortisol creation in that way. And, and we can definitely check that. And I encourage you to, when I, when I get an interesting lab in that way, I'll reflex to salivary testing to see what the diurnal and maybe even the cortisol making response look like. But for this patient, you know, we might potentially want to think about the causes of, of that uh, inflammation hypothyroidism and obesity, because again, we see in that metabolized cortisol, we have an appropriate level, just the body is favoring more shunting more towards um, cortisol, which can be harmful over time. So again, most people I would say have some inflammation going on, but digging a little deeper is going to give you some information. Um, I love urinary testing for that reason. And I just want to give you a little summary slide. So you don't have to think all about what I just said, but this is the way my brain works. Hopefully this helps you when you're trying to decide between, you know, what salivary test, urinary test. So salivary testing, that diurnal cortisol four points throughout the day, that's the basal testing, right? That's a good baseline. It's pretty much think about that as the gold standard. Um, you're going to see that circadian rhythm again. So rise in the morning, falling throughout the day. It's going to be helpful for you if you're trying to figure out, you know, where you might want to um, add in treatments throughout the day. Is it, you know, high? Is it low? The other aspect of cortisol, salivary cortisol testing is that cortisol awakening response. So this, remember, is a provocation. So we're poking the system a little bit. It's going to allow us to see that plasticity and reactivity within the system. And then, of course, we have urinary testing. And, you know, you can just look at the cortisol um, system here, but then you're also going to see other neighborhoods, if you will. Uh, there's uh, expanded panels that will look at sex hormones as well. Um, here you're going to see cortisol versus cortisone. Again, that's looking more at the enzyme activity. Metabolized cortisol, that's what the body has utilized. So we think about that more as like output. And then cortisol versus cortisone, more about metabolic preference. Now, I can't, I have to squeeze this in. We talked a lot about cortisol. There's so many things to do with it, but I also want to give you a little bit of information about DHEA. Now, DHEA is super important when we think about um, stress, the HPA axis, our little adrenals. Um, I will say they're 
cortisol and DHEA are made within the adrenal cortex. They are within different um, levels of that or layers, if you will. Um, they are uh, don't communicate. So their little zones don't um, communicate between each other. So we really want to think them about these as separate. Um, but now, why is DHEA important? Well, initially, DHEA is important because um, it's going to trigger, you know, adrenarchy. That's about the age of six when DHA levels start to really rise. So this phase is, you know, we think about proper brain development and reasoning skills and those kinds of things. Now, as we continue in adrenarchy, we'll see that that's, you know, pubic hair and axillary hair. We'll start to see the initiation of puberty um, and, and may activate the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal access a little bit. Um, you will see growth spurts and that's involved in skeletal maturation. So it was previously thought that DHA production is function only as a pro-hormone to be converted to testosterone and estradiol. And now that we know um, that in adulthood, DHA also plays a role in the stress response as it can be secreted in response to ACTH, just like cortisol. You know, DHA levels peak around age 20 to 25, and they gradually start to decrease with age, and that's anthropause. Aldosterone and cortisol levels do not decline with age. So that's, that's a little different there. Um, the, the concentrations have been positively correlated with, with lifespan, right? We have seen to help protect against atherosclerosis and diabetes and inflammation and osteoporosis. Um, it is available over the counter in the U.S., um, but the doses are often too high. So if someone isn't properly educated or they don't have information about testing, um, this could, could kind of make things go awry. I do see that in clinical practice sometimes. Um, here is an example of a DHEA, and this course person, um, you know, low DHE level. And since it is a pro-hormone, um, which can convert to estradiol or testosterone, I do recommend if, if you're looking into this or wanting to supplement, and adding in some sex hormones here, at least so we can see the estradiol levels and testosterone levels are within normal before, um, or, you know, even if they're low, that's, that would be safe to give a little bit of um, DHEA. I wanted to show you um, urinary testing for DHEA. This is this is really cool. When you are looking at DHEA, we have DHEA and DHEAS. So DHEAS is a storage form or sulfonated form. Um, and on your screen here, it's all the way at the top left if you're looking for it. I'm sorry, I don't have a my cursor. I can't get that to come over, but um, you'll see normal levels here. You know, DHEAS is upper range. That can give you some information already about the androgens that could potentially be influenced by DHEA here. So, you know, think about urinary testing also, and we have saliva, but also urinary testing for DHEA. I also wanna take the time um, to say that cortisol and DHEA, again, are made in two separate zones in the adrenal cortex, and they do not give, um, I would say, don't give DHEA thinking that you're gonna improve cortisol creation. But when you are giving DHEA, know that, DHA is also under ACTH stimulation, so it can tell you about this, maybe severity of, um, of HPA axis dysfunction within having a lower level of DHA, but it's not going to help cortisol. We will always think about dosing, so I just wanted to give you this. Um, I would say, you know, you can read about Addison's. That's not what we're trying to do. We're not replacing. We are thinking about physiologic dosing. For men and women, I do see a difference in what we need to give. Um, and I think, you know, going a little bit lower and slower with females is, is what I will tend to do. Um, so maybe even starting at five milligrams for females. And I and I think you, you can progress up. Um, maybe, maybe somebody will have a question about that. We could talk about it. But um, the route administration here for DHEA could be delivered orally, sublingually, topically, although I would say in the lab, we have observed that some of creams with DHEA do combine with the absorption of other hormones. Uh, for some reason, progesterone and DHEA don't always play regularly together well. So maybe oral is the one I would choose. You know, you're free to do what you want in your practice. I also want to stress that DHEA supplementation is not for children. So this can hinder their growth and development. It can close um, 
epiphyseal plates. It can also promote early puberty. So we're going to want to avoid giving DHEA in children. I'm at the end. We did it. We did it. I hope from this lecture, what you got was understanding you are not measuring the adrenals, but you're measuring the whole HP axis system. So that's the stress-induced alterations, as well as you know thinking about circadian rhythms. The cortisol awakening response can be used as a provocation test to elucidate a patient's reaction to a stressful stimulus, or as well as anticipatory stress or perceived stress. Again, timing is critical for that interpretation. So really wanna make sure it's done right. Take my advice. Um, and urinary metabolite testing can also give us insight into how the body is utilizing cortisol and how maybe even metabolic uh, processes are affecting cortisol. Um, and then when we also, when we think about DHEA, important marker for adrenal health, it's independent of feedback mechanisms with cortisol, um, but it can improve so many aspects of, of health and well-being. Okay, that is all for me. Does anyone have any questions? Hopefully there's a little bit of time.